Welcome to CS4510. I think this is 11 1, and today's topic is on Godel uh, incompleteness. So, as a sort of first warning for today, if you get technical enough, some of the things I will say today and expand upon are technically incorrect if you get semantic enough but I'm trying to give a very high level picture and so I'm going to omit certain details uh, of certain things hopefully you won't be too picky first off let's give a primer on logic how do you like prove things right you give proofs of things you give deductions but what are you actually doing you have some logical statement that you are trying to prove it follows from other logical statements sort of directionally with these like you can think of this like a these implications, these arrows. So to formalize this, what we have is a set of what are called uh, axioms and uh, a set a set of axioms are a set of logical A true statements without proof. So I've actually already introduced several problems here. So what is what is a logical true statement? What does those three words mean? A statement is a string over some variables and quantifiers. So it's a string over. You know the quantifiers like x x1 dot 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 xn uh parentheses and then relations so like equals and plus and all that right equals plus uh, multiply depending on the system let's just suppose the most general one it's what you understood stand to be a logical statement a statement is true if an assignment of its variables uh is correct now, this can also depend on many things, but just take this as your natural understanding of what a true logical statement is. So, for example, consider the statement, uh, there exists x such that x equals 0. That is technically a true logical statement. Included in the logical, in the axioms, are rules of deduction. So, the rules and techniques you would use to prove other things. For example, if you know P implies Q and you know P, if these are both true, then together these will imply what Q, right? If, excuse me, not P equals, if P implies Q and P, then that whole, those together will imply Q. That's your sort of deduction. This is called modus ponens. There's, of course, things like, you know, a negation, negation, P uh, is true if and only if p is true right actually if you if you you can find some people who will vehemently disagree with you about these kinds of things and they're called intuitionists they they disagree that certain things like this should be axioms but we obviously are more intuitional than those people and if you take the negative of something twice it has to be the same thing so we can assume things like this are in the axioms if you're looking for an axiomatic set of all of mathematics you could google something like uh a zermelo franken set theory and this stands for zermelo franken plus the axiom of choice. If you read these axioms, there's not much science that you're trying to understand. It feels like it's written by lawyers to remove certain paradoxes. So if you were to look towards the axiom of real numbers, you would see, see things like A plus B is always equal to B plus A. And, you know, associativity. So you'd have A plus B uh, plus C is equal to uh, A plus B plus c now if you were ever asked to prove these things you wouldn't you wouldn't have to you could just say uh it's an axiom therefore it's true it's sort of like a higher power that you can appeal to uh for free they're also but they're also statements that are so simple that they almost don't give you any power by themselves so there's other statements of course called things that you would know how to talk about which is called theorems a theorem is a true statement
is not an axiom. Oh, it's a statement which can be deduced from the axioms. As another, as another quick definition, uh, a formula is a statement with three variables. So, for example, uh, there exists x such that uh, x plus y equals uh, 10. Okay, y here is a free variable. So this you can think of like a function. You can think of like this is equal to f of y, and then y is plugged into this, and then and then y is plugged into this, and then we can talk about you know which values of y would make this uh, statement true. Then it's not a theorem exactly. It depends on what values of y would make it true. So here's another definition. We say, uh, I'll, I'll call it the word first, independence, and this is central to today's talk. We say a set of axioms is independent if no axiom can be I'll say proved from the others you may think of this sort of like linear independence where the vectors cannot be made from a linear combination of the other vectors this is sort of similar each axiom by itself cannot be proved from the others. This is not necessarily very important to the point of axioms, but it makes a sort of smaller and more minimal set of axioms that you could use to prove everything. If some axiom is provable from the others, you just remove it from the set of axioms and you take it as a theorem. Bam, you have a smaller set of axioms and you have uh, a new theorem. Doesn't particularly affect the truth value of it. Here's another definition of consistency. We say at a set of we say a set of axioms is consistent if there does not exist any statement P such that both P and the negation of P are true. I could write this logically as for all P, uh, P and uh, not p is false this should also appeal to your sense of uh, mathematics because have you ever met found a theorem of anything which is both true and not true can something be true and false at the same time hopefully not there doesn't exist anything you have seen hopefully that should have this property as a one Another definition, we say an axiomatic system is called complete. Uh, an axiomatic system is complete if, if uh, for all statements in the axiomatic system, obviously, uh, there exists either a proof of P or a proof of 
uh, the negation of p. So basically every statement is provable. Everything can be proved. You can either prove, you either have a proof of it or that it's true. You either have a proof that it's true or you come up with a proof that it's false. But every statement in the axiomatic system is provable. Uh, you can always come up with a proof for it. So early 20th century, let me take you back. There's these guys named Russell and Whitehead. They did a lot of other things, but they're more known for in this was they tried to formalize all of mathematics into some axiomatic system that would both be consistent and complete at the same time. They spent decades working on this. There's just several volumes of books written ab about this. It's called Principia Mathematica, and they've tried to derive some small set of logical rules from which all mathematical theorems could be proven and derived from. Uh, and they came very close, but what Gödel in completeness what his theorem showed is that you cannot have a logical system be with that is strong enough be both consistent and complete. What does that mean by it's strong enough? Well, it means it contains what I what I would what I would call sufficient arithmetic. So you if the axiomatic system is has enough power to do arithmetic, then you it cannot be both consistent and complete. And this was kind of a blow to these this these formalists because you know they spent decades working on this thing and then Gödel showed up and he's like oh yeah that's impossible let me give you an outline I'm going to give you two proofs of Gödel's theorems I'm going to give you the classical proof in the sort of the style that he did it using logic and I'm going to give you uh, another proof that follows from Turing machines so we'll start this one uh, Gödel like proof. So first of all, Gödel, this was in 1926, I think, he came up with stuff like what are called Gödel numberings. So uh, Gödel numberings. And I mentioned this briefly when we talked about encodings of Turing machines. Here's where that comes from. So we define uh, gamma takes on input a string and outputs a number. And such that uh, gamma of, let's say, w1, w2, dot, 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 to wn, we're going to look that up in a table, raise it to prime powers, and take the product. So I'll, I'll say the product of the ith prime, in the when you look up the, the corresponding symbol in a table, to that power, wi. And we'll say from i equals uh, 1 to n. So for each symbol you inv uh, in the table, you assign an integer value. So uh, for all a in a, uh, in sigma, define uh, t of w. Don't say t of a. So we'll say, we'll write it this way. I'll say a is on this side. And I'll say T of A is over here. So if we have the string 0, we're going to assign it the integer value 1. If we have the string S, which stands for the successor function, we're going to write this as 3. If we have negation, we're going to write this as uh, 5. If we have for all, we're going to write this as 7. If we have... Uh, there ex we don't need there exists actually because we can combine uh, for all and negation to get there exists, right? De Morgan's law. If we have open parenthesis, we're going to say 11. If we have closed parenthesis, we're going to say 12. Ooh, 13, excuse me. Uh, then he skips 15 and then he says assign the variable. So X, Y, and so on are going to be assigned to primes. So variables get primes and this is going to be uh, 17 19 and so on so y goes to 19 so what he does uh, then is he assigns every statement an integer such that no two statements are going to be the same Two statements are the, if two statements are the same, they have the same integer representation. And if you're given an integer by factoring it, you should be able to correctly deduce the the logical statement that it came from.
So to give you an example, consider the logical statement for all x. It is true that x or not x. This is called the law of excluded middle. Either something is true or its negation has to be true, right? Uh, now, if I were to convert this using the table, I would get something like, uh, well, for all is going to be 7, so I'm going to say, and that's the first symbol, so I'm going to say that's going to be 2 to the 7 times x is going to be 17. It's the only uh, variable here. So 2 to the 17, that's going to be 3 to the 17 times, and this, I could have used parentheses, so that's going to be uh, 5 to the 11, and then I say x again, so that's going to be 7 to the 17, and so on. Right, and then I worked this out, this sample is out, it's like, uh, I don't know, like 80 digits, so I'm not going to multiply it all out and, and finish it off. But you can hopefully see that uh, this function has a unique property, so that if, if gamma of x equals gamma of y, and that implies that x equals y syntactically. That, not that they have the same truth, they should have the same truth value because they're identical strings, right? So the important part here was not that this construction existed. This seems kind of obvious. This is sort of like an encoding scheme because you and I have used computers that have memory and everything on the computer from music files to images, whatever, has been representational as strings, as bits and bytes in memory. So this might seem obvious to us, but for the time, Godel had never used a computer. He had no idea this kind of thing was possible. This kind of thing was unknown to represent syntactic objects as integers. The, the important part of what he did was uh, you can determine the property of a logical statement by determining primality of its Godel numbering. So determine property about a logical statement using number theory. So for example, uh, if uh, p i x divides some Godel numbering of a, so a is a logical statement, and this is the Godel numbering of it, if it has this prime power in it, and p i x plus 1 does not divide the Godel numbering of a, then we know that this contains exactly the factor of pi to the x, which means we could tell something about the representation of it as a string. We could say, oh, this contains an equal sign or something like that, right? So then what Godel does is he proves on some 40 formula. He proves some 40 formula definable within the system. Of those, two are important to me. They're, all of them are important because, you know, they have to, he has to prove that these exist and are definable within the system. The first is the following uh, relations. Two relations we have for all x and y, which are natural numbers. We say the relation dxy is true if and only if the Godel numbering inverse of x is a proof of y. Y. So here, x and y are numbers, but their inverse map has to be a logical statement. So what we have here is that this is a logical statement. It's a combination of the axioms and the deductions and so on, which provides a proof of this logical statement. So this statement proves this statement. And we define that as D uh, with the relation D. So this relation is definable within the system with arithmetic. I will not expand upon uh, how that became because it could take me perhaps an hour. Hopefully you believe me this, uh, this is testable within the system. Uh, on to relation two, we say x of s on vy. So this has two right-hand uh, parts in the relation. A relation can have many, have more than two arity. Sometimes you'll see it written as r i x y z. Then, so we say this is uh, this denotes the relation where uh, v is a free variable. 
we string substitute uh, free variable v with string y. So what this literally means is we take the string x, it has some free variable v in it, we replace this, the free variable v with the literal string y. y could possibly be garbage, but we have this ability. We divide out by its prime divisor, wherever the v's are, and then we multiply through by the same prime divisor, but raised to the syntactic power of v. And v could be a string over who knows what, but it, this is possible. Okay, so both of these are definable within the system. These are possible operations. Hopefully you can believe that both of these are true. So now we're on to the theorems. Theorem, uh, this is Gödel's first incompleteness. Basically, it states any axiomatic system uh, with sufficient arithmetic. And I will not elaborate on what that means, but just assume it's good enough, quote unquote. If it's consistent, if it's consistent, then it is uh, incomplete. So recall, a consistent axiomatic system has the property that there does not exist a, uh, a proof of both P and not P. So P and not P are not bo cannot both be true. Right? Everything is either true or false, but not both. You cannot prove it in its complement. Right? A complete axiomatic system is one where there's a proof of something. There's a proof of everything. An incomplete axiomatic system is, th is therefore an axiomatic system that can define logical statements which are not provable. So what Godot does is he constructs an unprovable program. And he does it as follows. Consider the axiomatic uh, con con consider the, the uh, formula there does not exist x such that d x y in human words there does not exist an x such that x is a proof of y or what this means is uh so i'll write it out in english as well uh there does not exist proof of y now, y is a free variable here. This is a formula. So this statement as defined doesn't have a truth value, but it is correct so far, right? I can write this and have it be valid in the system. There does not exist a proof of y. Now, y, again, is free, right? So now we're going to substitute y with uh, the literal value the string y. So y is no longer a free variable, it's a string. And what that gives us is then that gives us there does not exist x such that x is a proof of y. We replace y with uh, the value 19 and y. Whenever we see syntactically the string uh, y we replace it with y here recall 19 is the string value for y so let's call this um this formula let's call this p of y so this is a function of y what we're going to do is take y here we're going to replace it with the value 19 here uh it's going to be replaced with y so this is a um formula consider that the godel numbering of this statement I'll write it as p instead of p of y exists. So I'm going to rewrite this on the next page, actually.
So what is then P of gamma of P? So what we're going to do is we have this logical statement. It has some Godel numbering. That's defined. That's fine. We're going to replace the statement Y in the goal in this. We're going to replace the string Y. The, we're going to replace the free variable Y with the string of the Godel numbering. So here we sort of created a self-reference. So what does the statement say? This statement has no free variables, right? So uh, P of, I'll write it again, P of Y says that there does not exist X uh, such that X is a proof of the replacement of Y. So we're substituting uh, this Y in the proof. Now P of gamma of P says, well, we're gonna. I'm gonna literally follow the operations. I'm gonna replace the string in it. That so this does not exist. X such that X is a proof of Gödel numbering of P, where we substitute in 19 Gödel numbering of P. Now, if we were to follow through with this, where we do the substitution, we're gonna get that P of gamma of P then equal to other does not exist x such that x is a proof of gamma of p of gamma of p again this has no free variables it's a it's a correct statement match two three four uh, so let this equal r uh, for simplicity. So what this is saying is that R is equal to that there does not exist X such that X is a proof of R. But that says, that's a, that R says that statement about itself. So what this says in English is a very, this is a valid logically, this is a valid correctly constructed log statement within the system which says I am not provable. There does not exist X such that X is a proof of R, but that statement itself is R. So we've constructed the sentence that says, I am not provable. Wow. By consistency, it's either true or false. Well, let me say it this way. Uh, assume to the contrary our consistent axiomatic system was complete. By consistency, either uh, R or uh, negation of R are true, right? So case one, R is true. Congratulations. We have a statement which is not provable. If R is true, it says I am not provable. So therefore we constructed a statement which is not provable from the axioms. That implies that uh, the axiomatic system was not the axiomatic system was not complete. Right? Recall completeness means every statement is provable. So the state, the axiomatic system is incomplete. If we have a statement which says I am not provable and it's true, we have an unprovable statement. Case two, R is false. Then, so uh, there exists a proof of it, right? Exists a proof of negation of R. But what does that mean? Uh, well, let's rewrite it. The negation of R says uh, uh, that there does not exist, that there does not exist in X such that X is a proof of
or we have a double negation here. So we can say that this implies that there does do, there there does exist x such that x is a proof of r. So there exists a proof of r. But by consistency, there exists a proof of not r since r is false so r is both true and false wow to finish off the story the formalists, including Hilbert, Whitehead, and Russell, were trying to formalize mathematics. They believed that uh, all of mathematics could be formalized in logical terms, and that their the search for the, like the best axiomatic system to encapsulate mathematics was worthwhile, and that their goals were achievable. And uh, so Hilbert was retiring. He's old at this point. He this is 1926, and Kurt Gödel is like a little young. He's a young guy. He's in his early 20s. Actually, younger than me, now that I think about it. But he, so, uh, Hilbert is giving his retirement address, and he talks about, you know, we, this is the most important thing in mathematics right now. What we need to do is formalize mathematics. We need to prove this. We can know, we must know, and we will know. It was like the angry German version of, uh, like, Veni Vidi Vici. It was this big, broad speech in his retirement address. And then, like, on the third day of the conference, at a little table, Gödel provides his uh, theorem. He says, ah, oh, we cannot have an axiomatic system that is both complete and consistent. So if you're consistent and you have strong enough arithmetic, you're actually incomplete, as shown here. And in fact, it goes it goes uh, stronger than that. If you suppose you try and act cute and you say, well, OK, I can't prove this statement. I'm going to take it as an axiom. Then I don't have to prove it. Well, that's fine, because this gives you a process to find another unprovable sentence within the system. This is true for any axiomatic system that's strong enough. It goes even farther into a blow to the formalist by Gödel's second theorem. Theorem. Uh, what did I call the first one? Any axiomatic system is incapable of proving its own consistency. Uh, let C be uh, the statement provable in the axiomatic system that uh, AS is consistent. So we're assuming to the contrary that C exists. In Gödel's first proof, we use the assumption that the statement, the system was consistent to provide an unprovable statement. So we can represent this as uh, by the first theorem Uh, that C implies R. So C, C again is the statement that says the system is consistent and it's definable and provable within the system. So C is provable. It's true. Uh, and R is the statement which cannot be proven within the system. By the construction of Gödel's first incompleteness theorem, we can represent this as C implies R. Assuming C, we get R. If C is provable, it's true then then so is r but we know r cannot be so the axiomatic system is incapable of proving its own consistency this is sort of almost like a lemma 
It was a big blow to Russell, Whitehead, and Hilbert, who spent their lives working on Principia Mathematica and wasted so much time. And Godel, he's a young guy, he comes out and he says, basically, not only what did you do, not only what you spent decades on, your life's work was uh, in vain, but the opposite of what you were trying to prove was easier, e more easier to prove, and it was true. So you were working towards a fake goal this whole time. Your life is wasted. So Russell Whitehead, these guys, they had like a gut feeling about something. You know, every statement should be provable, and they should, there should always be a way to prove it. And the work is just discovering the proof, but the proofs should always be there. You should always be able to prove something. And they had this gut feeling, and they went with it, and they operated trying to prove it. And then if they were smart enough to, you know, ignore their gut and try and prove the opposite, they would have saved, you know, several years. This is actually a very common thing that happens in mathematics, where people believe a certain thing, and then they uh, work, spend years trying to prove it. There was another story in the 90s. A guy spent seven years trying to prove a theorem, and then, like, one lunch, he considered the negation of it, and he, like, proved it in an hour. You know, you cannot prove something which is false. Things are not going to... The stars are not going to align. But if you try... If you just stop to consider the opposite direction, sometimes you get a good result out, and it works out. It might be less satisfying, and this is less satisfying, actually. This says you can't do things. I like not doing things, so I'm happy with this these kinds of uh, these kinds of results, but I'm sure the formalists took it as a huge and serious emotional blow. You may also notice a certain resemblance to Alan Turing's proof of uh, Hilbert's decision problem. So this was the first L Hilbert took, and then the second L Hilbert took was related to Turing's result. Turing, and also Church, built off this work by Gödel. They used Gödel numberings to talk about Turing machines with self-reference, right? So what they did is, by Gödel's proof here, they assumed some universality to the contrary. You know, for example, Gödel assumes there exists a complete and consistent axiomatic system, or Turing assumes, you know, decide, uh, halting is a decidable language. And then he constructs a contradiction which is self-referential in nature. The contradiction involves, you know, coming back to yourself, pointing at yourself. So to say something about the system within the system creates the contradiction. If you recall, in the halt, in the halting proof I gave, we constructed this machine using the decider for halt as a subroutine, and we ran that on itself, right? It has to do, these problems usually have to do with self-reference. As a final uh, aside, Gödel completeness does not say you can never determine the consistency or the completeness of a system. It's just you can't determine it from within the system. There are very small toy axiomatic systems like first order logic, which are decidable, but you have to use tools from outside the system to prove them from like a kind of godly top down surgical way instead of like within the system and you're playing around. You can actually prove Gödel incompleteness using Turing machines. And I'm going to give you the second proof right now. First, let me give you the weaker form. So we could have the logical statement, uh, really a formula. So we'll call it f the psi of h, which takes on input the numbering of a machine and uh, a word w. So it is uh, true uh, if and only if uh, m on w halts. So we're going to try and decide the halting from this. The exist so what we're doing, first of all, is proving that existence of an undecidable problem implies a weaker form of Gödel's first theorem. So assume, assume the axiomatic system is consistent and complete. Then consider the following algorithm. Uh, for i equals 1 dot 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 to infinity, check if uh, the logical statement represented by i is like correct. It's a logical statement, like a valid one that makes sense, not just like three parentheses or whatever. Um, is a proof of that m halts on w or the negation of that by consistency there exists a proof of either any logical statement or its negation 
So we're just going to brute force search for it. That would imply that uh, this logic that halting was decidable, which we know it not to be. So this implies halt is decidable. Now you may be asking, well, well, how do we uh, how do we define a logical statement based off a Turing machine and a word? Well, I'm going to give you a sort of different construction because I'm going to prove the stronger form. Let uh, phi of consider the logical statement that there exists x such that phi of m comma w of x is true if and only if m on w accepts. So the trick here is then that x is a very big number which would actually represent the computation history of m on w. So this x only exists if there exists a valid computation, a valid accepting computation history. So I'll say that uh, the total numbering inverse of x is an ACH of m on w. Here again is the same as true. Uh, for this, you to build this logical statement from m and w, you need some arithmetic actually, right? If you recall, the proofs for proving the computation history was accepted by a context-free grammar, very mechanical, very messy, or it was accepted by a LBA, it was less messy, but it was still necessary. You couldn't have done the same thing for regular languages. You don't have sufficient power. In fact, that problem was decidable for regular languages, if you recall. Consider that we can always build, given M and W, can always build uh, this statement. So, given any... Uh, M, W, always, we can always build some phi of M and W. So consider the following Turing machine. We'll call it S. This is Sipser's proof. So S takes on, on any input. It's just going to ignore it. We need, what do we need? We need something with the sufficient arithmetic and we need a self-referential part in nature. So I'm going to say uh, obtain the encoding of S by recursion theorem. The recursion theorem, the one from last time. We're going to construct the logical statement psi, which is defined to be there does not exist C such that phi of s comma zero of c is true. Brute force search for for either proof of psi or negation of psi if a uh, proof of psi exists except if a proof of negation of psi so we were able to prove that it was false exists we reject so this is the definition of the turing machine s you may notice immediately that psi is true if and only if s on zero does not accept could loop or reject so if S finds a proof of uh, phi, excuse me, psi, if F finds a proof of psi, that implies then that S on zero accepts. But that would imply that the sentence was false. If there's a proof of psi, that means psi is true, so there does not exist C such a sentence is true. Uh, but 
psi says s on zero does not accept. If s finds proof of the negation of psi, that implies that s on zero uh, does not accept. But then notice that the negation of psi is equal to the negate the negation of the negation of there exists c such that uh, uh, phi of s on zero at c is true, which we can use uh, the law of double negation here to say that there exists c such that phi of s on zero c is true, or uh, that there exists an accepting computation history. So this would imply that uh, S on zero accepts another contradiction. Okay, this was a very long, this was in my opinion one of the most important results of its class. It's also perhaps one of the hardest. We have to step outside our comfort zone quite a bit.